ponencia de Ignacio Tinguca. Esta llama dirigida a las iniciativas concretas que desde la Comisión Europea y fundamentalmente desde los, de la Eurostar están planteadas. El título de la, ponencia, de la ponencia es Propuestas para una mejor medición económica sostenible y de progreso social. Y trataremos de, bueno, va a tratar de, de realizar esta ponencia pues hasta, hasta las 12 menos cuarto y dejar por lo menos 15 minutos a, a, eh, pues para las cuestiones que se quieran plantear, preguntas, reflexiones, etc. Uh, okay, uh, in my second presentation, I promise that I will uh, give you much more practical information. However, of course, the uh, recommendations also of stigmas are of the very practical nature, but maybe it was a little bit too heavy, so I will give you a couple of more, uh, as I said, practical information plus uh, figures. Uh, in um, Well, I actually designed uh, two presentations that uh, uh, it is possible to clearly separate from one from the others because I thought maybe some people will uh, leave and some people will arrive and uh, that's why a couple of uh, questions will overlap but it seems to me that our audience is basically the same so I can uh, almost keep Uh, the first two questions, so I will just say a couple of sentences about it uh, on why going beyond GDP and the key international initiatives. But I will uh, inform you much more about the European platform against poverty in the EU 2020 strategy. I will generally give you more information about the EU 2020 strategy because it was issued already after uh, GDP and beyond and after Stiglitz Commission recommendation. Uh, and basically it's about the same topic of sustainability. Uh, and then I give you some statistical information about vulnerable groups of European population um, and also inform you about uh, some um, uh, projects which um, are de developed uh, by Eurostat together with our French colleagues, with INSEE, uh, on, um, on, sh on sh uh, uh, implementation of the Stiglitz Report initiatives. And because I'm director of social statistics, I will pay more attention to the measuring of poverty and inequality and also multidimensional measuring of quality of life and its statistical challenges. So I basically explain the uh, outlines of my presentation and let's start. Uh, I, I said already a lot why to go beyond GDP, but now I just want to illustrate what I've said with one uh, statistical uh, picture. In this diagram, uh, you can say GDP per capita. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, um, and the, another uh, indicator which is put on this um, uh, diagram is life satisfaction. Life satisfaction was, um, this indicator was collected by Eurofund in 2007. That's why, and I'm of course sorry for this, the information which you can see is uh, referred to the reference year is 2007. And I'm sure that now, in 2010, picture is quite different because life satisfaction is lower. And I'm not sure that it's equally lower, uh, so the picture can be different. However, even in 2007, we can notice that there is no linear correlation between uh, GDP per capita and life satisfaction. Um, you can see one extreme country, Luxembourg, uh, which is extremely rich in terms of GDP per capita, but less satisfied with life as compared, for instance, with Nordic countries. 
However, Luxembourgish people and statisticians always say that, oh, it's tricky to measure GDP, so don't uh, uh, give this example. That's why I'm very cautious with this example. But there are also some other examples. For instance, <coughs> Norway, uh, where, uh, again, GDP per capita is higher as compared, for, for instance, with Finland, Denmark and Sweden, but in Denmark, and, uh, in Denmark, the life satisfaction is higher, uh, GDP per capita lower, and in Sweden and Finland, uh, again, the life satisfaction is similar to Norway, but GDP per capita is lower. And uh, now there are three countries from uh, Scandinavian world should be comparable, but they are not. So uh, that means, I mean, this just illustrates that GDP per capita does not give the full picture of life satisfaction. And that's why it's one of the reasons just to illustrate why to go beyond GDP. Um, about recent initiatives, I've already said about GDP and beyond. I've said uh, a lot about Stiglitz and Fiduci report and its recommendation. Your minister actually mentioned in his introductory speech OECD Global Project on Measuring Societies. So I also would like to say that this is a very important initiative and we collaborate with OECD uh, in this uh, topic. Uh, I also mentioned in my previous presentation EU Sustainable Development Strategy, uh, which, uh, I mean, his renewed uh, version was um, launched in 2006 and when I was working in the previous directorate in Eurostat, directorate responsible for economic and regional statistics, I was responsible exactly for sustainable development indicators, which uh, were used as a main uh, evidence base for policy making and also for measuring progress towards the sustainable development strategy. But you may recall that I draw your attention to the fact that now European Commission wants to produce uh, more comprehensive uh, sustainable indicator scoreboard. But for this initiative mostly is uh, responsible uh, Director General uh, for um, uh, Environment, but of course in cooperation with your staff. But what I wanted to tell you is that the latest initiative, uh, it's not even the initiative, the latest in, in extremely important uh, communication from the European Commission is um, a European Strategy 2020. Uh, and this communication was issued in the first half of 2010. And right now, on 17th of June, all um, quantitative target uh, has, or measurable target for the strategy has been approved. So, and this strategy should be listed exactly uh, as a major initiative for better assessing progress and not just the progress but sustainable progress because the key word for this uh, strategy is also sustainability. So it should be seen in the context of all these uh, previous initiatives. And uh, I just wanted to underline that uh, GDP and beyond, Stiglitz recommendation, and EU 2020, uh, all these three initiatives and recommendations and targets, they have a lot of things in common. And that's why the uh, statistical community should try to meet uh, the needs of all three uh, initiatives in an intelligent way because as I said perhaps leisure, measuring leisure uh, and I don't know happiness perhaps for the time being is less important than measuring poverty so that's why I, as I said we should uh, in statistical community we should be selective we should really underline nowadays priorities but also to indicate uh, as a way forward, what can we measure in the future in order to better uh, meet uh, policy expectations. 
Now, uh, I wanted to give you more information about EU 2020 strategy. What it is about. So this strategy is a successor of the current Lisbon strategy, but also of sustainable development strategy. In fact, this new strategy combines uh, messages of both uh, previously uh, used strategies. Uh, moreover, if we uh, think about uh, uh, Lisbon strategy goals and achievements, I must say that uh, I wouldn't say it was a failure of European Commission but uh, and the European Union. But unfortunately, in the latest uh, years of uh, this Lisbon strategy, still in effect, uh, our society was hit by crisis, and even some indicators on growth and jobs, which were achieved in the past, they uh, we we then uh, monitored a big uh, step back. Uh, I mean, employment, which was rather reasonable, suddenly reduced, unemployment heavily increased, uh, GDP is very, the GDP growth is uh, marginal, if any, and also in, in 2009 it was downturn. I mean, uh, does it mean that the strategy was uh, bad? I wouldn't say so, but uh, on the other hand, um, uh, uh, the new uh, college uh, uh, I mean, new uh, European Commission. Uh, it was it, it very uh, important for them to suggest to the uh, European Community a new strategy uh, to go forward towards uh, basically similar goals. And uh, uh, EU 2020 strategy is about where the European Union should be in 2020. And uh, the most important words for, in this strategy are three words, smart, sustainable and inclusive. So the, the growth of the economy should be sustainable, should be smart and should be inclusive. What does it mean smart? That means that the economy should be based on knowledge and innovation. Why? Because it's extremely important to increase competitiveness of the European Union and its member states. Because without com being competitive, European Union cannot uh, survive and uh, to indeed move forward. Now, sustainable in the sense of the strategy is uh, to promote a resource efficient, green and competitive economy. Well, I would say that it's a little bit narrow definition of sustainability, but uh, it's exactly what, how it uh, should be read in the context of a strategy. And inclusive growth, this is also extremely important because this is growth which foster high employment and social cohesion. So this is what the strategy is about. And within this strategy, uh, the European Commission defined seven flagship initiatives and also as, as a set of measurable targets. Um, what about these uh, initiatives? The first one is to create innovative union, so it's about innovation and uh, smart growth. Now, youth on the move, youth on the move, it's about education, about uh, the next generation which should be also competitive in uh, terms of their knowledge. Um, and this is clearly linked to social statistics. Now, a digital agenda for Europe, it's more about competitiveness, research and development, um, uh, and smart growth. Now, resource efficient Europe, it's both, both about sustainable, competitive, and uh, smart. An industrial policy for the globalization era, 
an agenda for new skills and jobs, this is a task for social statistics and European platform against poverty also. Why I said that, the, I mean, all these seven flagship projects, of course, are policy projects. Why I'm talking about statistics? Because the development of these projects, the measurement of the results, uh, and generally uh, making the roadmap for, for the future should be based on statistics. And if there is not enough statistical evidences and or statistic is not well harmonized across the Europe and over the time, then it's difficult for a politician to take right decision within these uh, projects. But in so we are already prepared for many requests for maybe additional or just better quality indicators. But in addition to this, uh, European uh, strategy sets measurable targets to be achieved by EU 2020. And this EU target should be translated into national targets and trajectories. And now I again come to uh, the role of statistical community. Uh, the first target is 75% of population aged between 20 and 64 should be employed. I mean, in the current situation, it is quite difficult to imagine how the European Union will achieve this target, but we still have 10 years ahead. And our, you know, sometimes we're thinking in a quite inertial terms. If now it's downturn, and high unemployment in Spain is enormously high, then um, the inertial thinking is now it's impossible. But maybe it's possible, so it depends on, uh, on uh, decisiveness of our political ma policy masters, so we will see. But the target is there. The role of statistician is also, of course, to provide with a high quality inf and uh, European-wide information on employment indicators, but not only general employment, but of course by subgroups and so on. Um, uh, now, 3% of the EU GDP should be invested in research and development. Again, now with very high budgetary cuts, it's quite difficult to imagine how European budget will uh, find the money. Not, but of course, this is not only public spending, but also money ca ca coming from private sources. But anyhow, private, private companies also are in trouble. But however, for the private companies, I think that is the only way out of the crisis is to invest into something very competitive and innovative. Uh, anyhow, again, for statisticians, it's, it, it's not social statistics, but in my directorate I'm dealing also with information science statistics and with indicators on research and development. And uh, now we try to, I mean, uh, tomorrow I have the meeting with our stakeholders in the team, Director General on research and development, and we will discuss what exactly statisticians can do about improving of quality of research and development indicators, but in, in, in addition they need some more indicators uh, ex about European research area and exactly in the context of this uh, innovative union. So tomorrow I have to talk to them. Now, uh, the third target actually consists of three targets uh, on environmental. 2020 is just a nice combination of figures, but what does it mean? It means 20% less of uh, uh, emission, 20% uh, more on energy efficiency, and 20% more of renewal, renewal, renewable sources of electricity. So these targets, as I said, five targets, but in, in, uh, I mean, theoretically five targets, but practically much more. Uh, the next fourth target also consists of two. Uh, the share of early school leavers should be under 10%, and at least 40% of the younger generation should have a tertiary degree. So these both targets uh, concern education, and education is one of the dimensions of the qualitative life. Okay, so this is again. 
And uh, especially underline this uh, last target that 20 million less people should be at risk of poverty. I must say that at the European Council there was a very big debate exactly about this target. First, it was not very uh, clear uh, for the members of the Council and for national but, uh, I mean, for, for the EU polit uh, for politicians, whether this target should be in sight. This was a global discussion. But uh, less global discussion when it was decided that, yes, maybe under current situation, this is exactly the right target. But uh, the other discussion was how to measure it. How to measure these 20 million to be, uh, I mean, uh, less how to measure it and uh, again uh, if you look at the last um, communication from the commission issued on 17 of june i already mentioned it um, they as the council agreed about three targets to be used for measuring these uh, 20 million less people the first indicator is um, at the risk of poverty rate the second is material deprivation rate, and the third is jobless households. Mm -hmm. So we will have three indicators instead of one target. And uh, I will illustrate it later why, uh, because I wanted to really to, uh, in my presentation, to give you more information exactly on this very <coughs> hot topic, poverty and how to manage it. Now, let me really switch to this poverty problem. Uh, the Council, as I said, uh, on 17 June, adopted the target of reducing by 20 million the number of persons at risk of poverty and social exclusion. Now, according to um, information of Eurostat, uh, which is, um, I mean, the source of this information is EU Silk. Uh, and as I said, the number uh, referred to reference year is 2008. So, according to 2008, at risk of poverty, there are 16% of the European population. Materially deprived are 8% of the EU population. And being in a household with low work intensity, 9% of the EU population. Of course, there are large overlaps between these three dimensions, but what is also important is that, um, I mean, if we measure this poverty in a different way, we receive different figures. And uh, in order to not be, I mean, this is like, what, what, is, what is the way out? How, either to compose a, a composite indicator from these three, or to look, <coughs> which I prefer, at simultaneously at three different indicators and then to draw conclusions. Uh, but overall it concerns 120 millions of Europeans which, are, which we can uh, define as vulnerable groups of population. As a matter of fact, if you, can, if you read different commission communications, you can find the figure 84 millions. It means many, many communications. 84 million of Europeans are at risk of poverty rate. But, I mean, this 84 also, the source is the same, EU silk. But why we uh, use 120? That just don't be confused. Because this 120 covers not totally poor people, but people which are on the borderline between, between total you know, power, poverty and a little bit more, a little bit better. So that's why we call it vulnerable groups of population. So if you will find uh, in the literature, in the European Commission publication 84, uh, and uh, you can recall that I mentioned 120, please don't be confused, because the source of information is the same, just different interpretation. And don't forget that it's still 2008 reference year. So I, I'm even scared to think what would be the current figures. So we are now okay. When we will have the next EU sale, maybe, maybe uh, 
we will, we will be able to, to provide with the new information. And all my information in the uh, coming uh, diagrams uh, is the same, based on silk information 2008. Now, in this uh, slide, you can see uh, a risk of poverty rate of the European population. I mean, uh, there are all uh, 27 member states, uh, including Spain. There is no past country, sorry, but you can but, but you can compare your situation with the situation of the whole country. Okay, and uh, uh, with a weight threshold. So, and you can see that, of course, the situation in uh, different countries are, is indeed very different because, for instance, in uh, uh, Latvia or Romania, this is countries on, uh, on your right hand side. Uh, the poverty is, is uh, I mean, the indicator of poverty is extremely high, but the threshold is very low. So, these countries are in a relatively good position with regard to the threshold. They are beyond threshold, but doesn't mean as compared with the other European countries, the risk of poverty rate is, is enormously high. Uh, but uh, I mean, there are many other countries with uh, different pictures. Uh, as to Spain in 2008, uh, the risk of poverty rate was actually relatively high in the country, but was beyond the threshold. So you reached your uh, and threshold was agreed by your government. I mean, who selected the threshold for this indicator? Your politicians. So they selected relatively low threshold, and the indicator, as compared with threshold, was okay, but as compared with the other European countries, no, not really. Uh, now, in this slide, you can see a risk of poverty rates before and after social transfer. As a matter of fact, in Stiglitz's recommendation, I just didn't have time to draw your attention to small details. It's not actually small details, uh, but uh, it was said that it's extremely important to look at the indicators uh, uh, um, from the viewpoint of the government uh, uh, participation or gov government interventions, uh, and uh, I mean, a risk of poverty rate is one of the of example which clearly can illustrate the role of the government. Uh, because uh, uh, you can also see this very interesting uh, picture. Uh, increasing effect uh, from uh, the left to the right. Uh, it is the increasing effect of government intervention, government <coughs> subsidies, uh, or, yeah, uh, in order to uh, make the situation better. Because in some countries where the risk of poverty rate was relatively high, like Hungary, for instance, after social transfer, it is considerably lower. Uh, let me find Spain. Uh, Spain is this, I don't know whether you see, I'm not sure you see it, but this is on your left hand side, the third country. Okay, third. In uh, Spain, the intervention of government is not very visible. I mean, it doesn't change a lot the situation with the poverty. Understand what I mean? So I think that this is quite interesting information, but I'm sure you have all my uh, slides and you can then look at it. Uh, it's very interesting information how important is the information uh, intervention of the government in order to make the situation better. and. I'm quite, quite concerned that in this uh, crisis situation when all governments almost in Europe I mean, uh, uh, experience budgetary cuts, I'm afraid that uh, they can reconsider 
uh, the intervention. So this shouldn't be the case and uh, certainly it wouldn't be in line with EU 2020 strategy and uh, targets on poverty. Now, children at risk of poverty. This is another very interesting slide because uh, when I talked about subgroups of population, the poverty is a very good example when we should look in particularly of not only migrants but also in the distribution of age. Uh, and children are at risk. Uh, again, you can find the countries with more or less or less risk. And um, as to Spain, is a method, there is a Spain, I cannot find here Spain. Well, anyhow, you will find it. Uh, now, um, I switch to the second measurable target. This is material deprivation. Hmm, what does it mean, material deprivation? I must say that in all countries, it's actually different. Because, for instance, uh, in the UK, uh, washing machine or, uh, I don't know, TV is not a big deal. I mean, every household, even the uh, poor, you know, have this access to that. But it's not the case for all new uh, European uh, member states. I'm sure it's not the case for Romania or Bulgaria. And this material deprivation is uh, average, <laughs> average, for the Europe, what we use in Eurostat for EU silk. And just to give you some information what does it mean, those who experience at least four out of nine deprivation people can afford, cannot afford uh, to pay their rent or utility bills, to keep their home adequately warm, to face unexpected expenses, to eat meat, fish, or a protein equivalent every second day, a week of holiday away from home once a year, a car, a washing machine, a color TV, or a telephone. So this is European definition, European, average European definition of material deprivation. And now we came to the chart. You know, this is uh, uh, how this uh, picture of poverty measured why material deprivation looks like. You know, if we can go back to my previous slide on, on uh, at risk of poverty, you can see it's different. Yeah, it's a different picture. Now we can come back. So this is actually a, well, a, a good illustration that the conclusion depends on what we measure, how we measure. Uh, now, this is uh, another diagram which illustrates how these both indicators, the risk of poverty rates and material deprivation rates, how they correlate. And this is also very interesting because uh, um, there are a number of countries where the correlation is quite reasonable. Uh, for instance, on the bottom the left hand side and on the top uh, right hand side, but all the rest there is, I mean, material deprivation with a poverty, at least the power provides totally conflicting picture. Uh, now, the third indicator is low work intensity. So, this is, as I said, the third indicator to measure uh, uh, poverty. And those living in households. Uh, exploiting one fourth or less of the working capacities. This is a definition. This is a definition. So it's not totally jobless, but it's almost jobless households. And this is again the third picture. Uh, low work in in intensity. And again, the picture is different. I just uh, will show you a couple of uh, slides for EU 2020. It's very nice animation. The problem is that I do not have time. So, uh, 80 million, no, actually not 80, but 84, but around it. Uh, uh, then is um, 40 million are material deprived. And. Uh, 
and this is 43 million uh, in low work intensity. So this is the, ev and you see there is, a, of course, overlaps, and I don't have time to uh, it make you more oral information. I will just go ahead because this is interesting. Uh, I don't know how to make it faster. <laughs> So, it, but the, it brings me to 120 million in vulnerable groups. You know, these 80, roughly 80 plus, plus 40 plus uh, uh, 9, uh, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, give this uh, 120, roughly. Now, next picture. Next. Uh, okay, this is the same, but in percentage. This will be Romania. Uh, just to give you the example, if I would have a lot of time, which I am supposed to have, I would make it nicer. Okay, this is just very different picture as compared with the average EU, because you see, there are 24% at risk of poverty rates, 33% material deprived, 45% in vulnerable groups altogether, but only 5 or 8% in low work intensity. So this is just illustration that for different uh, groups of countries, the picture is very different. Now we can compare this uh, EU 2020. <coughs> Is exactly Romania. <coughs> now, Netherlands, another case. And this again, absolutely different slide. Because, uh, you know, the figures are absolutely different. Mm -hmm. And these is three pictures you can compare that <coughs> how these indicators uh, provide the same three indicators, but for different European countries, provide totally different pictures. UK. Okay, this is again percentage distribution for the UK, which provides again a next picture. And then we can compare all, all four pictures. I mean, of course, we selected the countries um, which, um, I mean, which indeed have very different um, um, uh, evel uh, assessment of these three indicators in order to uh, underline that. Uh, we cannot use one single indicator for for European Union. Uh, and this is basically the same. This is the same. I should. Uh, uh, okay, this is just country groups. Country groups which are um, um, uh, placed on this diagram according to three dimensions, three indices. Huh? So some countries, exactly including Spain, uh, which is uh, which shows quite high uh, risk of poverty rate, uh, but quite low material deprivation, and quite high uh, um, jobless or low intensity households. Um, but as you see, these groups of countries. Uh, as they can be placed in this diagram in a very different, uh, uh, different place. Okay, now I am afraid I do not have time, but I will say because I promised to, to finish. But I will just say a couple of words of our, of our initiative. Okay, your start is now working together with INC. This is statistical authority of uh, France and also with uh, participation of member states, uh, including, for instance, Spain, uh, 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 on implementation of the Stiglitz report recommendation. But we are now, you know, we are now confronted with a different documents, very important, including EU 2020. That's why we, our approach is to define immediate priorities which are closer to EU 2020, but also mentioned in GDP and beyond and uh, Stiglitz. We define these as our first priorities, and all the rest will be implemented in 5-10 years from now. Um, 
we have three task forces on uh, basically three uh, big domains. One is household perspective and distributional aspect of income consumption and wealth, measuring inequalities. I must say that the leader and directorate is national account, uh, but the social statisticians participate a lot because this is about linking of social surveys with national accounts. And already France made it. So they already had a very good pilot project, uh, ref uh, reference year 2003. But even now, when they showed this distributional aspect and the real picture of inequalities in France on basis of their findings, it was extremely interesting. And we would like to spread this experience in the Europe, in Europe, and also in Eurostat, we will try to make something with European accounts, European national accounts, and so. The second dimension is uh, environmental sustainability, and uh, <coughs> Director Pedro Diaz is, is, is the in, uh, uh, chair of this, uh, co-chair of the task force, and multi-dimensional measures of, of quality of life. This is exactly why. Uh, dimension. I'm chairing this task force together with my colleague from France. Uh, we had already the first meeting in uh, June, and uh, in uh, September we already have to provide the first uh, findings, the first uh, um, recommendation for the roadmap immediate action and also the action to be done in the year ahead. So I don't have time for this. Uh, I just wanted again to say that uh, quality of life is on the crossroad of the recommendation and our immediate priority is to better measure poverty and social inclusion, education, labor market, research and development, distributional aspects of quality of life, uh, including social uh, indicators on distribution of inequalities. So this is our uh, immediate priorities, which we should uh, implement uh, as early as we can. So, uh, okay, statistical challenges, we have a lot. Thank you very much for your attention, and um, I'm open for your question. I promise 10 minutes, even 15, but still a little bit more than 10. Please, the floor is open. Thank you very much, Sina. Eh, te agradezco mucho el haberte ajustado al tiempo, y al mismo tiempo es una lástima en la interesante presentación que nos has hecho eh, esta fase de conclusiones finales, pero creo que. Eh, una visión panorámica sí, que aunque rápida al final hemos podido obtener pero al mismo tiempo cumplimos con el objetivo de dejar un pequeño espacio para las 12 terminar y así tenemos 10 minutos para cualquier cuestión que se pueda hacer en la sala que seguro que habrá eh, cuestiones interesantes a plantear así que si, si hay cualquier cuestión por favor nos, eh, nos indicáis para que se pueda recoger en, en la cabina de traducción y la pueda yo sí quiero comentar que en las transparencias que, que nos ha proyectado no aparecía la comparación con la comunidad autónoma de, del País Vasco, con la comunidad autónoma de Euskadi, pero que eh, Eustat eh, publica su encuesta sobre la pobreza, con lo cual quienes tengan interés pueden establecer también comparaciones específicas de nuestra comunidad autónoma. Sí, tenemos aquí una pregunta, por favor si pueden pasar el, el micrófono, aquí en la tercera fila. Sí. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. I'm going to ask my question in Spanish and so you get translated. Tenía una pregunta sobre el instrumento del que se va a dotar la Unión Europea a nivel armonizado para medir la aproximación subjetiva a la calidad de vida. Estoy hablando del subjective well-being y la satisfacción con diferentes dominios. Eh, USIC no contiene la batería de preguntas que tradicionalmente habían venido en la encuesta en el panel europeo de hogares. Entonces quería saber, ha hablado de bueno, pues, 
la necesidad de pasar de cuáles son los drivers, cuáles son los determinantes de la calidad de vida a cuál es el output, a una buena medición del output. Lo que quería saber era, de alguna medida, eh, en qué momento va a entrar dentro del de marco armonizado de las recomendaciones a los estados, que se vuelva a medir eh, los diferentes dominios y la satisfacción con los diferentes dominios. Okay, I, well, I, I hope I understood you well, but uh, um, it is envisaged now uh, in 2013 to have a special model in silk uh, for measuring uh, subjective indi indicators of subjective well-being. Um, it has been recently agreed with um, the employment and also with other users. Um, Of course, in order to harmonize uh, any statistical indicators, there should be output uh, but also input harmonization. But this is another output and input, it's not about drivers of uh, well-being. I mean, uh, in the questioner, the uh, question uh, should be actually harmonized across the European countries, otherwise everybody will collect um, different information about subjective well-being, you know, relevant to their own countries. Uh, I must say that in the European statistical system, we uh, legally binding with output harmonization, not by input harmonization. However, if we would like to achieve Uh, comparable results across Europe, not only in one specific countries, then of course we should try at least in a reasonable way to harmonize uh, these questions. Yeah? So I hope I understood your, your question well. Si, alguna otra cuestión, por favor. Uh, hello, I will speak in, sp in Spanish because for me it's more easy. Mm, yo quisiera hacer algo crítico. No me parece mal, eh, siempre se aprende viniendo a estos sitios. Yo soy un maestro, no entiendo la verdad mucho de economía ni estadísticas. Pero bueno, he hecho ciertos apuntes y quisiera ser crítico. Cuando, por ejemplo, aquí tengo apuntado, he apuntado unas cositas. Cuando decir que los políticos nos dan información suficiente, a mí me cuesta creerlo porque siempre nos están diciendo que sí, que todo vendrá mejor, pero por ejemplo, hace poco leí un informe en el que como el PIB de Estados Unidos, bueno, la producción di dijeron que creció y que Estados Unidos iba mejor, claro, pues que las empresas ganan más, es, puede ser verdad que la hayan hayan ganado más, pero no dijeron el montón de trabajadores que fueron despedidos para que esas empresas tuvieran beneficio. Así que a mí me cuesta creer que nos digan la verdad. Luego, hay una interconexión, cuando he dicho que a lo mejor es menos importante medir la pobreza y que medir más la felicidad. Creo que eso está directamente interrelacionado. Cuando medimos eh, el trabajo, el yo creo que yo, si teniendo un trabajo, seré feliz, porque podré realizar muchas cosas. Eso es indispensable para ser feliz, pienso yo. Cuando uno es pobre, no creo que es feliz. Empresas fuera de la crisis. Yo creo que no hay ninguna empresa fuera de crisis actualmente. Eh, las empresas, a lo mejor los patronos no están en crisis, pero, por ejemplo, hemos tenido aquí grandes huelgas del metal, eh, la semana pasada hubo una huelga general y no creo que eso es porque la gente esté feliz. A mí me cuesta creerlo porque toda esa gente pero, que viene a la calle. ¿Podría concretar la pregunta? Porque... No, yo estoy haciendo reflexiones. Sí, pero eh, estamos en el turno de preguntas y sí le pediría, por favor, si tiene alguna pregunta para Ine en función de lo que has puesto, pues eh, nos haga la pregunta concreta, una o dos preguntas, eh, en lugar de una, okay. una declaración. ¿eh? Okay, well, bueno, es mi, es mi opinión, ¿no? Pero es lo que yo pienso, subjetivamente visto. 
Y no creo que sea el único que opine así. Ok, fine. Y no lo quiero decir para atacar a nadie, pero bueno, es mi análisis de la realidad. Y me cuesta creer que la intervención de los gobiernos, pues ahora mismo los gobiernos que hay me parecen unos títeres. Todos, todos, todos obedecen al FMI. Que, y cuando, cuando obedecen al FMI todos aplauden, pero no he visto que el FMI se haya preocupado por toda esa gente que está en el paro. Ellos lo único que han querido es... Perdone, no quisiera ser descortés, pero digo, si puede formular su pregunta, le agradecería para dar turno también a otras personas que quizás tengan también interés y quieran preguntar algo. ¿Eh? Y por último, tenía por aquí una estadística que medía, que estaba aquí, me gustaría saber cuándo fue formulada, porque creo que era de... Material de privation, no por el año en que se hizo, y bueno, quisiera ver más o menos las estadísticas del futuro. De acuerdo, muchas gracias. Ok, uh, okay. I will uh, uh, try to answer a couple of your questions. Uh, maybe it's easier to start with the last one. I repeatedly told in my presentation that all figures which I provided you referred to 2008. I can only repeat, reference year is 2008 for all figures mentioned in my presentation. Now, I wouldn't like to be lost in translation if you saw this movie. Uh, what I've said was that for the time being, it's more important to measure poverty and we can measure happiness a little and also leisure time later. That's why my second presentation was actually devoted to measurement poverty and I have not said any word about happiness, not at all. Okay, so I wouldn't like to be misunderstood. Measuring happiness is important, but maybe nowadays it's more important to measure poverty. Now, you said that politicians provide you with the wrong figures. I think that it's our ability to make a right interpretation because figures are neutral. The figures are politically neutral. And statisticians, we provide impartial, more or less accurate, more or less comparable figures. Figures can be, of course, always better. But, I mean, they are not political, it's not political figures. And all the rest depends on interpretation, how you explain and how you understand. You mentioned, you know, it's not my role now to comment the U.S. economy. However, if I would have uh, time and if I would be here at another capacity, I would make it. Uh, you, uh, the, just to say that um, the situation in U.S. economy is uh, not rosy, not at all. They have huge uh, macroeconomic imbalances and the, they have a little bit uh, uh, raise of GDP, but it's still not convincing. So, but uh, as I said, uh, I'm, no, I'm here in a different capacity. I'm here representing Eurostat, and I'm not representing neither uh, IMF nor uh, ECFIN. Okay. Si una última pregunta, por favor. Well, um, I, I've got two questions and one comment. Um, maybe the questions are not are related to Stiglitz report, but not exactly to what you just presented. So, if you consider they are not in your field, just let me know. The first question would be that um, in Stiglitz report, one of the things they mention is that public services are not well evaluated. So the quality. <coughs> public services have. For instance, I, I, think, I, I, I think I recall that they compare, for instance, the health expenditure in the United States and the health expenditure in some European countries, 
and there is in the United States. They spend more money in health. Uh, our life expectancy in health is better than they. So, whereas our expenditure is less. So, uh, it is recommended to uh, measure better the quality of public services and account for them in national accounts in a better way. So, is there any work being done in that field? Because I think that also might help when measuring the quality of life and the poverty of people. Because we have different social systems in place and nowadays it, it's maybe a very pretty moment to not to measure it properly. Then my second question related to sustainability. Um, I've seen that the EU is interested in sustainability but what I also read in Stiglitz is that um, it's suggested also to try to measure uh, human capital to, to measure if our society is also sustainable in that sense if we are investing enough and if we are accounting for that investment and also for the quality of that investment. So I wanted to know if there is also work on that in the EU. Mm -hmm. And finally, just a comment related to um, indicators for measuring <laughs> politics and so. Um, in, 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 your, in your presentation you mentioned that you, you said that you have to use indicators for goals and for trajectories. And uh, I think it's essential to, to set the indicators for trajectories because otherwise you can cheat on stats, on statistics. I mean, you can just go for the, for the main indicator for the goal but with not the proper trajectory or um, method, let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for questions and comments. Um, I fully agree that and I s tried to uh, highlight it in my presentation that the quality of public services in uh, national accounts uh, should be better measured and the comparability across the countries could be also better achieved because you're absolutely right. There are different systems of uh, both health, education, uh, defense, uh, police, whatever. It's very different. And that's why, of course, there is um, uh, quite difficult to compare. However, statistic, statisticians can do to the extent possible and uh, it's quite difficult to go beyond. Uh, I have not heard, that I'm not working for national accounts directory, I have not heard that uh, there is a, a special project on the improvement of this uh, measurement of uh, services um, as, a, as a special project. I can clarify with my colleagues, but really I have not heard. But uh, what is going on now, it's uh, the major step in the area of national accounts is done towards the new classification. So partly, maybe partly, this problem will be met by the new classification. Huh? But um, I'm sure it will not be solved uh, completely. Uh, and um, of course you are right, that, uh, in, but in the United States, this is also a you know, question of efficiency of the system has not been reflected, should be reflected by just another statistical instrument. It seems to me that national account, this is basically what it is, accounting on the global level. From the accounting you can not always draw the results about efficiency of the system. Uh, in the US, in the, US uh, the President Obama uh, wanted to uh, improve the situation by his health reform, but I mean uh, the health reform is also a matter of debate in the EU. However, the European system generally is more efficient and uh, uh, okay, but the education also is different. I mean, national accounts is an instrument which I, I, I think, I'm convinced, cannot give the answers to all questions, should be supplemented by something else. Uh, now on sustainability and human capital. Uh, we are working on the project on human capital with the uh, OECD and also with the United Nations. 
Uh, it is not the first priority of Eurostat, I must say, but we are aware of this uh, uh, problem and uh, to the extent possible we try to contribute. Thank you very much, Ina. Muchas gracias a todos por vuestra asistencia. Hemos perdido cinco minutos respecto al tiempo de previsto. Eh, a las doce y cuarto, para así retomar el calendario y el, 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 el programa que teníamos previsto, eh, tenemos prevista una eh, conferencia donde participarán, están presentes con nosotros, Imanol Tubero, eminente sociólogo y profesor de la Universidad del País Vasco, y Mariano Gómez del Moral, que pertenece al Instituto Nacional de Estadística. Eh, muchas gracias a todos.